do not attempt to adjust your station. Do not attempt to adjust your screen. Do not attempt to adjust your channel. I have got to tell you right now that I am firmly in control of the situation. And what you see is I don't know, kind of like a modern day version of a test pattern. You can see that something's going on. You can hear that something's going on. But nothing apparently is going on just yet. Although you sort of get the feeling that something is going to be happening very, very soon. And if you're a regular on this planet, on this internet, on this social media site, then you can probably guess that when the curtain is dropped, that when we have the big reveal, you are going to see and hear me, Malcolm Tent, your host for this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. No, wait, well, there we go. There we go. Perfectly balanced. Look at that. What a marvel of modern day engineering and structural balance. Yes, Tent Talks Tunes. That thing is not going to fall over. It is propped up beautifully. A little bit wobbly. Then again, who isn't? All right, let me take this down very carefully. Whoa, whoa, hey, ooh. Oh, okay, good, there we go. Whew. You people don't know what a risk it is every week trying to do that safely and without disaster breaking loose. Whew. But in spite of all the danger, I do it for you, to you, with you, and at you every single Wednesday live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Facebook. And for those of you who cannot or will not tune into Facebook on a Wednesday, archived forever on my YouTube channel, and of course on the Facebook page in question and indirectly on my website, www.malcolmtent.net, your one-stop clearinghouse for all things relating to me. I'll admit I've been kind of remiss in my duty. I have not updated the website in a while, but considering that it's been on the web for, I think, 12 years now, if it's a few months out of date, it is still far more up-to-date than it is out-of-date. I don't care if that makes sense or not. That's my cop out. That's the way I choose to explain the ex explain the situation. And that's what you, the public, have to deal with. Yeah. Well, I may get smarmy just a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see who's tuned in right now. Using the monitor, my pocket-sized cheap monitor. Oh boy, we got a whole bunch of people there. We got the Gelmans from Tucson, Arizona. We got James Pogo from the Arm Delight Rifles. We got Callie from California. Larry from Connecticut. And according to the monitor, four others. But it won't tell me who the four others are. And the monitor counter shows more than that. So I don't know what's going on. I just know that you guys are here and you're able to see me and hear me and listen to my blather. And I do thank you very much for that. So, gang, let's start checking all the various databases. Here we got to check the bulletin board, we got to check the mailbox, and then we got to get into talking some tunes. Now, as you might have seen me waving this thing around the camera, before I started yapping, this is indeed an envelope, and it did indeed arrive in the mail, and it's very flexible. And I think I might know what's in it, but we're going to find out. I love this plastic envelope action. It sounds really good when you go to open it up. By the way, the mailing address is right here. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. And these people apparently knew. Ah, this is a very good thing. This is a, a, a mailroom item that belongs on the bulletin board. This is an event that I'm pretty excited about. Check it out, gang. 
Punk Rock Flea Market, Sunday, July 17th of this year, in the somewhat unlikely town, is it South Barry or is it Southington? If it says South, you know it's unlikely. Where is it? It's either South Barry or Southington. I think it's Southington. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, gang, I'm going to say you really should put the name of the town on the flyer. I'm pretty sure it's Southington. 168 Center Street in Factory Square. It's got to be Southington. But yes, it's going to be a whole bunch of vendors, including myself. I'm going to be selling a lot of damn records. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the people who put together the second Sunday market in New London, Connecticut, where I set up and sold records just a couple of days ago. It was a beautiful day right there by the ocean. Uh, cool people came out, had a really good time meeting folks and hanging out, including a few people who knew me, not only from Trash American Style, but also from Tent Talks Tunes. So that was cool, baby. I love seeing you folks here on the internet. I love meeting you in person even more, especially when there's a table full of cool records in between us and we get to talk about them and exchange ideas back and forth in person. So that was great. This is going to be great. And I'm glad I got it in the mail. Well, we got big flyers. We got little flyers. Oh, check this out. A laminate. I can tell right now this is going to be a class act. So I'm going to put the laminate on right now. So I'm official starting now with the Punk Rock Flea Market in Southington. And of course, if you check my website and check my Facebook, we'll be talking about this a lot more. Because punk rock is fun, flea markets are fun, records are fun, and hanging out with you people is fun. Also fun, this arrived in the mail, the latest issue of the Bridge and Tunnel Crowd magazine. I am a big fan of the Bridge and Tunnel Crowd magazine. This one is great because it's got a an in-depth article on the history of the uh, Yale versus the people of New Haven. And I mean in terms of physical combat. There are stories here from the 19th century in which the residents of New Haven uh, liberated some cannons from the local armory and wheeled them down to New Haven, and we're getting ready to blow the place up. I guess things like that happened a lot in the 19th century. Very, very interesting historical articles, and it's uh, the kind of history you ain't going to see hardly anywhere else. So Bridge and Tunnel Crowd, thank you for the latest issue. If you guys like your really eccentric, uh, cynical, jaundiced history with a big tongue-in-cheek, get accurate. Bridge and Tunnel Crowd. I don't work for these people. I get nothing from this except the satisfaction of reading the new issue whenever it comes out. Print media is alive. Now, that's the mail. I did get something in person. This is almost as good as mail. In fact, it's, it's even better than mail because when I was at the second Sunday market in New London this past Sunday, I met the artist known as a former friend a dude named Toby, and he gave me a copy of his album, which I actually traded for a copy of my album, The Multiple Moods of Malcolm Tent. We had a good old-fashioned album swap. I gave him mine, he gave me his. I haven't heard it yet, but this has already got an aesthetic that I like. I don't know what's going to happen when I play this record, but I have a feeling it's going to be pretty unusual, and I like the unusual. So thank you, a former friend. I hope you like my album as much as I'm sure I'm going to like yours. All right, that's the mailbox. Let's check the bulletin board for current events and happening deeds of daring do right here that affect me and that affect you. And I'm once again going to check the monitor and make sure I'm still on. Oh, and now I can see some names. I see Jason Liddell. I see Frank. Oh, boy. AK, oh, the artist formerly known and probably still known as Rat Bastard is in from Florida. My old pal Jeanette in New Haven is tuned in. Mr. Tink Tink is watching from North Carolina. Jim Dolan, welcome aboard everybody. Okay, exciting news as we check the bulletin board. I'm sure you all have heard the news that Mad Brother Ward, <clears throat> the long-serving, long-suffering guitar player for Anti-Scene for the last over eight years 
has recently resigned his position as anti-scene guitar player. We hate to see him go. He's a good dude, an ace musician, and definitely put his fair share of blood, toil, tears, and sweat into the anti-scene machine. And he has decided to go into another direction in his life. He's kind of zigging and zagging. We're sort of zagging and zigging. So our paths didn't intersect anymore. But we wish only the best to Mad Brother Ward because he's Mad Brother Ward, man. You gotta love the Mad Brother. Plans I've got for releasing Mad Brother Ward material are still very firmly on the schedule. There's going to be a Mad Brother Ward anthology cassette and CD on my label, TPOS. I don't know exactly when. Who knows when? I don't know when. But just to show you how efficiently Anti-Scene Incorporated is run, dig this timeline. We played our last show with the Mad Brother on May 20th, last May 20th. He officially announced his retirement on the 22nd. He let us know that he was leaving the band on the 22nd. On the, on the 24th, Jeff Clayton, the unimpeachable president for life of Anti-Scene, had a virtual band meeting with myself and Sir Barry Hannibal in which he told us who the replacement for Mad Brother Ward was going to be. And both Sir Barry and I said, yes. And two days later, the announcement was officially made on the Anti-Scene Facebook page. And I don't know if you guys have been following it, but I'm going to tell you right now, giving it my spin. A short while ago, we did a split 10-inch record Anti-Scene on one side. And our good friends from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Before I Hang, on the other side. Well, guess what? Mr. Walt Wheat himself, who looks very much like this in real life, is now the new guitar player for Anti-Scene. So it wasn't a very far hop, skip, or jump to find somebody to take the guitar spot in Anti-Scene. And the uh, reaction to Walt's choice as our new guitar, guitar player has been overwhelmingly positive. We feel good about it. The public feels good about it. Walt feels good about it. It's just one of them feel-good moments, you know? Can I get an amen? Can I see a shower of hearts and thumbs up and cuddly faces and little heart-eyed emojis at the announcement of Walt Wheat joining our band? Can I see it? Can you make the monitor light up? Can you folks give us a blizzard of emotion? Can we do it? Ah, there they are, yes. It's nice to see that people are as happy as I am about things. Ms. Gelman says, celebrate with a Southwest tour. Well, let me tell you, Ms. Gelman, next year, the year 1983, is the 40th anniversary of Anti-Scene. And our plan as it is now is to play 40 shows in our 40th year. And that means touring. And we haven't set anything in stone yet. We've hardly set anything in gelatin or in sand yet, but that is definitely the plan. We want to get out there and take it to the people. So put that in the trap and think about it. Speaking of taking it to the people, another item on the bulletin board, my good pal and TPOS recording artist, Tim Holhouse, a man who I have toured with more than anybody else. Tim and I have done several circuits around parts of the U.S. of A. Tim has taken me to England twice. He's taken me to Northern Europe once. He is a true gentleman and a hell of a performer. And he and I are touring the Northeast in October. Yes, Tim and myself in October in the Northeast. And we've got some tentative dates. We're looking at October 13th either in Danbury or Bethel, Connecticut. We are looking at definitely October 15th, <clears throat> excuse me, at Willimantic Records in Willimantic, Connecticut, 
I love playing record stores. Thank you, Joe, from Willimantic Records for setting that up. We're looking at possible gigs in New Brunswick, Flemington, Stroudsburg, York, and other points in between. So if you guys would love to see two hard-working acoustic troubadours between October 13th and the 19th, let me know. Because Tim and I want to throw down in your town, in the Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania area. We want to do it. All we need is a place to play, a place to crash, and at least a chance to pass the hat. We're very easy to work with, and we will work hard for our money. So yes, contact me if you want to book me and Tim in October. We aim to please. And I got one more item on the bulletin board, which is not really an item on the bulletin board. This is what might become a new semi-regular feature here on Tent Talks Tunes. This is a page that I am borrowing from the playlist of Mr. Jeff Clayton, who every Tuesday has his own streaming Facebook event called Break On Through, which is on the Anti-Scene official Facebook page. Friday, uh, sorry, Tuesday is at 5 p.m. Pull up a seat on the front porch and sit and talk for a while. Jeff has been doing top tens for a long time now, and I have recently gotten the inspiration to start doing my own top ten lists. And um, this is where we can get a good discussion going right now. I mean, we, it's always a good discussion here on Tent Talks Tunes, but I'm going to throw some more fodder at you. Top ten songs by The Police. Yes. People might not be aware of it, but I am a giant-sized fan of the police. The police are one of the few bands that I have every single album, every single single, and all sorts of variations on colored vinyl and picture sleeves and import pressings. I am just gaga over the police. So... You might think this would be a very difficult list to make, but it's actually very easy. Because I was just sitting down at the kitchen table uh, thinking, well, what are my top friend, my top 10 police songs? They just came at me one after another. Very, very easy. So number 10, and as usual, numbers 10 through 2 are not in any particular order. They're just as the one, just as they came to me. Number 1 is Edged in Stone. Okay? So just for giggles, number 10 can't stand losing you first police song i ever heard on 103 she during that very brief window of opportunity when florida fm radio went new wave and they were playing the police a lot and the first time i heard can't stand losing you i fell in love i love that sparse jagged sound i thought the lyrics were hilarious um, production was clean and simple. It was the exact opposite of what was being played on the radio just a couple of months before then. So The Police, Can't Stand Losing You. That's the song that made me fill out a mail order form to a place in Canada so I could get the first Police album because it was not available anywhere in South Florida at the stores. I had to send away to Canada to get it. And I did. My first copy of Outlandos D.N. Moore ever was a Canadian pressing that I got by mail order. And wouldn't you know it, within a few weeks of me getting this record from Canada, it started popping up in the stores everywhere because Roxanne had become a hit shortly thereafter. But, uh, yep, I had that cherished Canadian pressing of Outlandos D.N. Moore. That was my gateway into the police. Um, number nine, just for the heck of it, When the World is Running Down... You make the best of what's still around off of their Zenyatta Mondada album, which, along with Regatta de Blanc, those are my two least favorite police records. Those are the two police albums that I really don't listen to very often at all, unless it's if I want to hear some examples of Stuart Copeland's songwriting, because there's a lot of those on Regatta de Blanc. And uh, I don't know, they're, they're not bad albums at all. They just don't catch my fancy the way that 
the other three do. But when the world is running down, that's a song that just grabbed me immediately. And that is permanently lodged in my police top 10. Number eight, just because it's a number and because it's a police song, Low Life. A song by the police called Low Life, a very obscure B-side to, I think it was Spirits in the Material World. It was a UK 45. The police were always very user-friendly. Their singles, more often than not, had non-album songs on the B-sides. So it was a lot of fun to collect their records because you'd always get an extra song that you couldn't get on the regular album. And this one song in particular never came out in the States. It was a UK-only B-side. And wouldn't you know it, it's such a good song. It is such a good song. Even though it appeared on a single from the fourth album, it was recorded for Zenyatta Mandata. And I think Zenyatta Mandata would have been a much better album if this song had been put on it. Low Life. Great song. Killer bass line. One of the few songs with saxophone that doesn't make me want to puke. But that's a different story for a different day. Low Life. Number seven. Also off of Atlantis Dia Moore, Truth Hits Everybody. Great hook. Weird lyrics. Love that song. Love it. Number six, number five, and number four. Three in a row from the Ghost in the Machine album. Side one, track one, track two, and track three. Spirits in the Material World. Every Little Thing She Does is Magic. And Invisible Sun. That, my friends, is what we call a one, two, three knockout punch. That is the way to start an album. Moody, atmospheric, deep. The sound of those three songs perfectly matches the record cover and the labels. It's mostly black. It just, it's perfect. Perfect packaging, perfect music, perfect match. So that's three slots in a row in my police top ten. Ironically enough, the two songs that come after that, after those songs are completely dispensable as far as I'm concerned. And then side two of that album is kind of the same thing. The first couple few songs on side two are utterly worthless. But then you've got Omega Man, Secret Journey, and Darkness, which make for a hell of a closer for the album. So it's kind of like a, I don't want to say shit sandwich, but starts out strong, nothing in the middle, ends really strong. Let's put it that way. All right. Number three, another B-side. One written by Andy Summers, a song called Someone to Talk To. That was on the B-side, I think, of King of Pain in the States. And I think that, once again, the album Synchronicity would have been much better off if that song had been on there on side two instead of one of the mega hits, I know, King of Pain, Every Breath You Take, uh, what's the other one, Wrapped Around Your Finger. I know those are the three biggest selling songs the police ever had. I don't like either of those songs. If the three B-sides from Synchronicity, Someone to Talk To, Murder by Numbers, and Once Upon a Daydream had been on Synchronicity, then that would have been the best album they ever did instead of one of two of the best albums they ever did. Which leads to another one of my big favorites, Tea in the Sahara, the last song on Synchronicity. Man, Goosebump City, chills and thrills every time I hear Tea in the Sahara. What a great, beautiful, sublime way to end a recording career. So, so good. And that leads to number one, my number one favorite police song of all time. Guess what, kids? I'm cheating on this one. I am cheat, cheat, cheating with my number one favorite police song. And the more I do these top 10 lists, the more you're going to get more of these cheats. Because let's face it, I am a sovereign individual. I am a self-governing human being. When it comes to my music, I run my life the way I see it. And sort of like the Cheshire Cat, when I use a word 
to describe my favorite song, I use that word exactly as I use it. It means exactly what I say it means. So when I say my favorite top 10 song by the police is the complete side one of synchronicity, you'll just have to get over it. Now, why would I say that an entire album side is my favorite single song? Because the way that that album side is sequenced is so perfect. The six songs on that album side fit together so seamlessly and so flawlessly and flow from one song to the other so exquisitely that in my mind, it's always been one song. I, I really honestly cannot take one of those songs and play it in isolation without having the others there, you know? And I'll, I'll name some other examples. Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. How do you take one song off of Pet Sounds and just listen to it? You got to hear the whole thing, the whole thing. It's just so perfect. We're Only In It For The Money by Zappa and the Mothers. Absolutely free by Zappa and the Mothers. You can't just take... Let's make the water turn black off of We're Only In It For The Money and say, well, it's my favorite song because it's a, an absolutely integral part of, an, part of an entire larger piece. You have to count it all as one. And that's the way I look at side one of synchronicity. It just, they should have banded those songs together on the vinyl without any track separation because it's just one perfectly flowing composition. So that's my big cop out if you will my number one favorite song by the police is actually the six songs on suite of synchronicity there i said it i'm living it a toast to the flexibility of language Let's check the monitor real quick and see if people are outraged or if they're uh, on my side Let's see, Larry from Connecticut guessed uh, that Born in the 50s was going to be my number one favorite police song of all time. Close. I just love Atlantis DMR. It was such a radical record. James Pogo, yes, mentions the Clark Kent records. I would absolutely have to give a, a, an honorable mention to the first Clark Kent EP, which was Stuart Copeland's solo stuff, which came out right around the same time as the first two police records. Great, great, and very much cut from the same cloth as the early police. So yes, big shout out to Clark Kent, AKA Stuart Copeland, big, big favorite. All right, so we've gone through all that particular stuff. Let's get right down to the main topic of Tent Talks Tunes. Let's put on our time machine garb and set foot into said time machine and throw the way back lever to the year 1988 to the location Brookfield, Connecticut, specifically the four corners of Brookfield, Connecticut, the intersection of Station Road and Route 7 in Brookfield. That was the location of the original Trash American style, our original 293 square feet of punk rock countercultural storefront was there at the Four Corners. And we made a lot of friends very quickly when we first opened up our record store. And one of our very first and most regular customers ever was a guy named Steve. And we called him 70s Steve because when we opened up in 1986, the 70s were absolutely not cool, man. There was nothing cool about the 70s, dude. Not the music, not the look. Nothing was cool about the 70s. And this definitely ties into the story I'm about to tell. But Steve had a definite look and ethic of his own. He wasn't afraid to wear, to wear bell bottoms and a turtleneck. He sported that. Hence, he got the nickname 70 Steve. And one day, 70 Steve came in 
as he, he did every single week with a great big long want list of records. And he asked if we could get a record by a brand new group from Seattle, Washington called Mud Honey. And the record was called Touch Me, I'm Sick. He said it was really rare and hard to find. He said it was on brown vinyl, didn't have a cover, and had a picture of a toilet on the labels. I said, well, that sounds extremely tacky, but you want it, I'll try to get it. So you got to remember, 1986, pre-internet, pre-Amazon, pre-everything. There was nothing in 1986. Nothing. Nothing existed in 1986 except Trash American Style, a notebook, a pen to write things in the notebook, and a telephone. Not a telephone but a big, hard plastic thing with a bunch of wires sticking out of it that sat on your desk or hung from the wall that you had to pick up and it was at the end of a cord and you punched all these buttons or you dialed this round thing to make a telephone call to somebody. That was all that existed in 1986. So in order to get this record by this group called Mud Honey, I had to write it down and then pick up the telephone and start making phone calls. Lots of phone calls. You know, because when you're at a record store, you got to get your stuff from somewhere. And that's usually a distributor or a record label or a band directly. And I always preferred to order stuff directly from the bands and or directly from the labels. That was always my modus operandi. It still is. But sometimes you just can't do it that way, so you've got to call a distributor who carries lots of bands and lots of titles by lots of labels. So I started making phone calls, and nobody knew who this band was, who this Mud Honey was, or anything about this record. So, you know, that happens in the business a lot, and I had to, you know, Steve would come in every Friday, and I'd say, well, Steve, sorry, no action on the Mud Honey, uh, but here's this you know, this uh, record by the Cramps you wanted, or this record by the Stems that you wanted, or, you know, whatever. But after however many weeks and however many inquiries, I finally found a distributor who had this record by this mysterious band called Mud Honey. So I ordered a few copies because my number one rule, well, I have a whole bunch of number one rules, but my number one rule was if somebody ordered a record I would always bring in two or three copies of it because I figured if one person wanted it, someone else would. And that usually served me very well. It was also really cool for discovering new music. So lo and behold, I placed the order and maybe a week or two later, however long it took for the box to show up, I was able to open up said box from said distributor and pull out the Mud Honey record. It wasn't quite the way that 70s Steve described it, because it did have a picture sleeve, and yes, it had a it had a toilet on the picture sleeve, but the vinyl itself, whoops, it's out of the sleeve, was black, and it had the logo by the of the label that was on this label called Sub Pop, which I had never heard of before, knew nothing about. All I knew was this was a record ordered by one of my customers. So I got the record, called up Steve, he jetted right down and picked it up and said, you want to hear it? I said, sure, let's give it a spin. So we took his, his freshly purchased copy of the record, put it on the in-store turntable, and that was the first time I heard, touch me, I'm sick. And my head just sort of went, And then it went, it was a great feeling. Remember what I said earlier about how the 70s weren't cool in 1986? Well, 70s Steve sort of gave the lie to that myth, and Mud Honey firmly knocked that myth in the head and threw it in the grave because just the sound of that record, man, just the sound of it, 
you can't imagine how incredibly new and fresh and original the sound of that record was because nobody at that time was making music that I was aware of that sounded like that. It was like all cheap guitars, cheap effects pedals, you know, I mean, it was just like not cool in the slightest, but you gotta remember that hair metal was like the big thing in, in mainstream culture at that time. And our stock and trade was like straight edge hardcore. And this group Mud Honey didn't sound anything like either of those. They didn't look like either of those types of genres. They they also they weren't goth. They weren't new wave. They were loud as hell. They all had long hair and jeans, and they didn't look cool in the slightest bit. God damn, what a great record! And then we flipped it over and played the B side, which was Sweet Young Thing Ain't Sweet No More, which was the biggest sludgiest, nastiest sounding song I think I'd heard since Grand Funk Railroad, like basically. And Grand Funk, I can assure you, was very uncool in 1986. So here's a band that captured all, all of the great elements of 70s rock without irony, without apology, just going for it full bore. And this, my friends, was the gateway into this thing that later came to be known as grunge. Now I just want to state for one second here that the term grunge was already in the atmosphere. My own band, Broken Talent, in 1984 in Florida. Believe me, to be in Florida in 1984 was to be, about as, to be about as isolated from all things cultural as a human being could possibly be. We were stuck way down there on the bottom of the peninsula, surrounded by hostile territory in Dade and Broward County, and then with a vast gulf of nothing between this hostile territory and the civilized world. So we didn't know Jack. But when we when we started out, we called ourselves HANGCOR, H-A-N-G, HANGCOR. And HANG was an acronym for Hardcore Art Noise Grunge. Where we got the word grunge from, I don't know. I certainly didn't use it in my daily vocabulary around then. But it, it described our sound, you know, Hardcore Art Noise Grunge. So that was just there, you know. And then a, a, a few years later, before, I'm pretty sure, but in fact, I know for a damn fact it was before Mud Honey because I went to go see uh, Sonic Youth play. I saw them play in 86, in 87, you know, before this Mud Honey record came out to, to us in 88. And I remember specifically Kim Gordon on stage talking about one of the opening bands and saying how cool it was to play with a band who knew the true meaning of grunge rock. Don't know if that were her, if that was her exact terminology, but she definitely described one of the opening bands as grunge. And it was the same deal. The genre, there, there was no genre of grunge, but that was the word that Kim Gordon used to describe one of the bands. So it was, you know, it was just there. It was a word that was already just kind of there. And these bands that started coming out of the Pacific Northwest just sort of got described that way, you know, because they definitely were grungy. You know, they, they looked kind of dirty and unwashed and greasy. Their sound was definitely dirty and unwashed and greasy. And it sounded grungy. You know, it sounded like something you would scrape from underneath your nails in a good way. You know, that's what it sounded like. It's what it felt like. It's what it looked like. And it just seemed like all these bands started coming out of that part of the country. Because soon after that, another regular customer of mine asked for this band called The Fluid, who were from that area and on this same record label as this band Mud Honey. So The Fluid was the second one I had heard of. And then there was this other band that 70s Steve wanted called Soundgarden. 70s Steve was big on trying to get the first two Soundgarden 45s, which we never got. They're impossible to get. 
I still, to this day, don't think I've seen an actual copy of either of the first two Soundgarden 7-inch records. But when, um, what was the name of the EP? The Soundgarden EP that came out on Sub Pop. I forget. Whatever their first EP was that came out on Sub Pop. We were able to get that in. So then, between like Mud Honey and The Fluid and Soundgarden all being from that part of the country and all on the same record label, you kind of had a thing, you know? And it just sort of ended up tying into all these other bands who are from different parts of the country that sort of had that same sound and that approach as well. Dinosaur Jr., of course, being the first one that comes to mind. Um, to a degree, Sonic Youth. Of course, the Melvins, who it could be argued invented the whole damn thing themselves. Don't know if I would argue that. Maybe you guys have an opinion on that and you'll want to post your opinions. Could be argued that the Melvins started this entire thing that we know as grunge. Um, early Flaming Lips fell into that category. Because to my ear, the first few Flaming Lips records just sounded like Dinosaur Jr., to me, they were Dinosaur Jr. clones, which is why I never liked them that much. Uh, Love Dinosaur Jr. Flaming Lips, I thought, were just like a cheap knockoff. So, stuff like that. Locally, in Danbury, we had the Almighty Head. Head. H-E-D, baby. Head. These guys were doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. And I can pretty much guarantee you that these guys might have known about some of these bands from the Pacific Northwest, but certainly were not influenced by them and were not copying any sound. In fact, it was Jim Roberto, the guitar player for Head, who first told me about this band, The Flaming Lips. He said, you should check them out. They're, re they're really weird. They use wah-wah pedals. And Jim was already using a wah-wah pedal at this time. And I've got to reiterate, wah-wah pedals were verboten. You were practically not allowed to use a wah-wah pedal at this time. You just didn't do it. But Jim Roberto was using one, and this band, The Flaming Lips, were using one, and these bands from the Pacific Nor Northwest were using them. So it's just one of those things, you know, just for whatever reason, at the same time, in all these different places, for the same reason, I don't know, but everybody sort of had the same idea at the same time. It really makes you wonder how human beings communicate with each other on whatever subliminal, subconscious, alien spaceship way, I don't know, but it seems to happen fairly often that similar ideas sprout up at the same time in completely different parts of the world. So this idea of long-haired, unwashed, dirty blue jeans, cheap guitars, cheap effects pedals, not martial amps, this all started sprouting up in different parts of the country at the same time. All I know is that it made life very interesting and exciting for us in Danbury, Connecticut, because now we had something to key into that was happening elsewhere. You know, so when these bands started touring, we'd have new bands to see that we already knew we liked because they sounded like what we were doing. It was very, very cool. And I posted this on my Facebook page yesterday before I get too deep into that post from yesterday, let's uh, see who's walking. Yeah, we're still on the air. No technical glitches. We're still live. That's good. I posted yesterday because um, when I was in New London on Sunday, sitting behind my table pricing records, I came across this 12-inch EP by Mud Honey. And it just reminded me about how Mud Honey were the first band from that scene to get a big push. They were the first band, excuse me, to tour the country. They were the first one of those bands to go overseas. 
They were the first band of that movement to get their records released overseas. This is actually a German 12-inch single on the Glitter House label. Looks like a sub-pop record, but it was licensed to this, to this label, Glitter House. See, nobody else was getting that kind of treatment, the 12-inch single treatment. And there's the A side of it. And there's the B side of it. They were the first to get it. And what I thought was really super cool when I was checking the inside contents of the cover, I came across this flyer, which detailed the German tours by these upcoming Seattle bands, Mud Honey, Tad, and opening for Tad, Nirvana. You'll notice that Mud Honey and Tad are the ones who get the pictures and the headlines. Nirvana just happened to be on the bill with Tad, but that's what grunge looked like in 1989. And you look at the back of the flyer, and they talk about all the grunge bands that were hip and happening at the time. Mud Honey, Cat Butt, Le Thugs, Helios Creed, Bastards, Cows, God Bullies, The Fluid, Vanilla Chainsaws, Lomax, and then a couple of compilations. You've got the Sub Pop Rock City compilation and the Dope Guns and Fucking in the Streets compilations. And they talk about some upcoming releases by a band called God, The God Bullies, Boss Hog, The Board, and First Things First. Not one mention of Nirvana anywhere on that upcoming release schedule, and only a, release, only a mention of Nirvana as the band who were touring with Tad. That's what it looked like in the pre-mainstream media grunge days. Nirvana did not invent it. Smashing Pumpkins did not invent it. There was a lot of music by a lot of bands happening before anybody knew or cared about all those bands that were going to come later. This is a pretty cool artifact. And I'm going to mention that it is for sale. <laughs> I'm not particularly married to this one. I'm going to sell this one. If anybody wants it, let me know. HMU, as they say. Send me a message. Now, my first ever live experience with this grunge thing occurred in March of 1989, March 11th, 1989 to be specific, because once again, I'm pretty sure that it was 70s Steve who came into the store one day and said, guess what? Mud Honey is playing in March. They're playing at Maxwell's in Hoboken. We should all go. And we were like, yeah, let's go. Let's go see Mud Honey. Let's see him play live, because by then I just about worn out my copy of Touch Me, I'm Sick. And I believe that Super Fuzz Big Muff had been released by then, their first six-song EP, which is another absolute masterpiece of grunge. So Mud Honey was getting a lot of turntable time and the chance to see them live. And guess what? The opening band was this other group, Soundgarden. It was Mud Honey and Soundgarden playing live at Maxwell's in Hoboken. So. In case you didn't know or have not heard of Maxwell's in Hoboken, let me tell you a little bit about Maxwell's in Hoboken. If anybody there was it, has ever been to a show at Maxwell's, I want to see some a demonstration of some love. I want to see some thumbs ups and hearts and things like that. If you ever went to a show at Maxwell's, I want I want to see you represent, and I want you to post and tell me what was the best show you ever saw at Maxwell's, or maybe you played Maxwell's. If you saw or played Maxwell's in Hoboken, leave a comment, because Maxwell's was something else. Hoboken at this time was a place where angels feared to tread. It wasn't ghetto per se, but it was just nowhere. It was absolutely nowhere. It was right across the river from New York City. You could stand on the shore of the Hudson and 
see New York City 50 yards away. But culturally, you might as well have been on the planet Venus. The people who, who lived in Hoboken and the sort of culture there was in Hoboken had zero to do with New York City. That's when New York City was New York City and New Jersey was New Jersey. The twain could not possibly meet. Yet for some reason in Hoboken, there was this really cool venue. Maxwell's was a restaurant, like a regular sit down, fairly nice restaurant in the front. And in the back, they had like an old storeroom that they cleared out and would have live bands play. And through whatever process, I don't know, but the best bands in the universe played Maxwell's. I mean, I think of the bands I saw at Maxwell's. Unbelievable. Even bands who long after they got to a certain level and were playing much bigger venues than Maxwell's would still play Maxwell's. Maxwell's, I would guess, you could probably cram if you tried really hard and used raw brute force and you were like, the Japanese dude on the Tokyo subway ramming people into a subway car, you could probably wedge 200 people into Maxwell's. Like if you wanted to pack them in so that there was no room between human beings at all, you might be able to shove 200 people in there. If you wanted to have a comfortable audience in there, 75, maybe 100. That's my estimate. But God dang it, Mud Honey, Soundgarden, Stereo Lab, Rollins Band, Dinosaur Jr., Sonic Youth, Bob Mould made his solo debut at Maxwell's. Dinosaur Jr. made their debut after the big schism between Jay Maskus and um, Lou Barlow. They debuted at Maxwell's. They were already playing, like, you know, theaters and stuff, but they would play at Maxwell's. So I don't know how they did it, but Maxwell's just had the best bands ever. And so to see this new band Mud Honey and this new band Soundgarden playing at Maxwell's, no brainer. Work at the store all day, drive two hours to Hoboken, catch the show, drive two hours back home, sleep for a couple of hours, open up the store, run the store all day, Maybe go to a show the next night. That's the way we did it back then. We just never stopped. Sleep was optional. So it was very exciting to see this, this band that we loved, Mud Honey, at Maxwell's. And sure enough, you know, it wasn't like there was 200 people wedged in there, but there were probably like 100, 150 people there, maybe. Pretty good crowd. Choking on cigarette smoke, dripping in sweat. The band is drunk. The stage is about the size of my desk. In fact, I remember the drummer for Soundgarden had to play in this little alcove behind the stage because there wasn't enough room for him on the stage. I guess they had too many amps. I don't remember exactly why, but the drummer was unseen the entire night. Mud Honey did fit on the stage and they were drunk and out of control and it was just like beer flying through the air and cigarette smoke and I don't think there was any slam dancing at this point, but it was just a real grungy damn show with overdriven, cheap, loud guitars and cheap guitar effects pedals and these extremely uncool, long-haired dudes who vaguely look like scrawny lumberjacks. That was the essence of it, you know? And there was something, it was just like, to my eye and the way I experienced it, completely natural, not contrived, really organic, the real deal. It was an awful lot of fun. And, you know, it just so happens that about four months later, this other band called Nirvana, who were from the same area and on the same label, started coming through and touring, but I wasn't very interested in them at the time because I didn't know anything about them at the time. But that is another story for another episode of Tent Talks Tunes. In fact, I've already done that story. If you go to my YouTube channel, 
you can hear the entire sick, twisted Byzantine, almost heartbreaking story of how I did not see Nirvana twice on the Bleach tour. I did not see Jason Efferman's last ever show with Nirvana. I did not see them playing the CMJ showcase or whatever the hell it was. I had the chance to, but I didn't. But that led to me seeing them in New Haven in 1991. And that's the story that you can find on my YouTube channel on my Tent Talks Tunes playlist. So yeah, that's it. That's one man's experience with grunge and how it began and how other bands that predated grunge, such as Naked Raygun, could sort of hitch their wagon to that rising star and get a little bit of shine and get a little bit of glory, which they deserved very much. This record is perfect. Perfect record. Came out in 87, baby, and if they got the benefit from grunge, more power to them. And then bands that came a little bit later, such as Bench. My God, what a sludge feast. One of the best things ever made possible by grunge. And of course, Head, who had a couple of good years after that. Tons of Dan Barry bands and many bands that we all know of from that era. And we all know what happened to grunge and alternative rock. But I'm in a good mood. So I ain't going to talk about none of that. Instead, what I'm going to do is thank you guys for tuning in. It is always a pleasure to sit down in my beat-up old office chair that the cat has torn into little tiny ribbons. And to talk music with you guys. I'll be checking everybody's comments a little bit later. And we'll be commiserating as we typically do. I do indeed intend to be back in about one 167 hours time. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>